Earlier on, I made a video called How Skyrim Ruined Bethesda. And it was a video essay based on the subject of how Bethesda operated pre-Skyrim with design and communication versus how they operate nowadays, talking about Fallout 4, Fallout 76, and most recently, Starfield. Now, all these videos that I prepared toward the end of the year are made in a vacuum of sorts. I don't put them out and then read the comments and then put out my next video like I usually do because I'm taking some time off. And this video, much like that original video essay, has been made in a vacuum. I kind of wanted to have the video essay and then the conversation afterwards, where the video essay was what I thought was a fair, critical look at how Bethesda operates and was less about the machine engine Bethesda and more about understanding what kind of company they have become nowadays. Today, I wanna to talk about how to, quote, fix, end quote, Bethesda. They're an extremely successful company. They make a lot of money. In their eyes, they need no fixing. And there are some things that are said online about them that I disagree with. One of those being a subject in this video, and I'll call it out when I get there. But what I wanted to talk about is how to get Bethesda to where they're walking that line of being the profitable, extremely popular company that they have become, while also maintaining that core fan base and how to sustain that for generations to come beyond the days of Todd Howard. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. If you're new here and you're into Bethesda content, we prepared a lot of it for this holiday season. Consider subscribing, we got a lot more on the way. So the first thing I wanna tackle here when it comes to fixing Bethesda has to be when it comes to their team size. They are an extremely small team of around 400 people. And I say extremely small in the terms of AAA development. That's usually pushing past a thousand, multi-thousand. And of course, when you account for Microsoft and the QA that was backing them up, like, yes, yeah, Starfield had a massive staff on board for this game. But Bethesda has that, if you will, small business feel, but big business mindset, so to say. And if I were to go in there and start tinkering with how they approach things, I would say, okay, you wanna be a 400 man team. Let's start building your games around that mindset. What that means is that procedural isn't your answer for everything. I think procedural content, like we saw in Starfield, is the result of development costs getting higher, game development becoming more difficult, and you need to make that same massive scale of worlds that you made back with Fallout 3, back with Oblivion, but it's much more difficult to do now, so you need a computer to effectively generate it for you. I think what needs to happen is a slimmed focus. You can still make worlds to live in that are highly replayable at the same time as maintaining what makes your game special. You can still maintain scope and scale in meaningful ways while not making, for example, a thousand plus planet galaxy. Now, I really do like the idea Starfield's presenting, but I wonder if sometimes Bethesda's biting off more than they can chew. Something that we've talked about with 76, something we've talked about with Fallout 4. I will say though, I hope that Bethesda in turn maintains the quest focus. To me, that was Starfield's biggest strength, and I hope they maintain that because that can provide focus for the team. What are our strengths? I feel like questing is one of them. It's about the adventure it sends you on, where even if it's not the quest itself that's incredibly well written, it's about when you're going from point A to point B, that thing that distracts you along the way. Quest focus fuels the best parts of Bethesda Game Studios, whether their games are gigantic or tiny. And that would go hand in hand with what I said in my video essay, reconnecting with the actual reasons for Skyrim's success. At the same time, when I am talking about acting your team size, that may mean inadvertently kind of thinking about how you're supporting Fallout 76. I think if you have a 400 man team, you can make the games you still want to make, but you kind of need all hands on deck for the production of them. You can't afford to have multiple teams of your development force involved in a live service product like this. At the same time, I will say 76 is getting much better. Atlantic City was a pretty good step forward. Nuka World on Tour was also pretty great. There's still a lot corrupt within it on a technical level, but I can see why they wanna hang with it. Bethesda just wants to do that. They wanna do the same thing with Redfall. They just refuse to let go of these games to their credit. But I feel like if you need to accept that, like you're a smaller business, a smaller staff, it's time to act like one. Maintaining a live service game, consistent support for Starfield for five plus years, supporting Fallout 4's next gen update. You can only go so far with the manpower that you've provided yourself. So 
start acting your team size. This next one I'm gonna go in on because Bethesda's communication has historically sucked. And especially in 2023, I think it was really bad. I think of the Fallout 4 next gen update is the prime example of that. I get that we all knew in the Fallout community, oh yeah, whatever this Fallout TV show drops is probably when you're gonna drop the next gen update. That is our assumption as intelligent gaming fans. You Bethesda, it's on you to not announce a next gen update, which is considered a very small free thing, whatever thing, and confirm it for 2023 and then give us no word whatsoever all the way until the final dying weeks of 2023. You go, yep, it's delayed to 2024. See you then, we're excited about it. Yep, see you then. Your communication has to get better, not just for an instance like that, but I look at Starfield as it stands right now when I'm recording this video in the vacuum, no real roadmap. We get random promises on Reddit like, hey, we're gonna do new ways of traveling. Hey, we're gonna do more bug fixes. We get the occasional Bethesda net post. Sometimes we find out news through that. Like there's no consistent lines of communication from the development team to the fan base. And especially with Starfield, a game with a lot of complaints, most people are willing to, as we've seen with like Cyberpunk, as we've seen with every broken game, Battlefield 2042, like people look at it, they go, God, you're hopeless, it's dire. But you know what gets them all out of that situation is communication, letting people know what the plan is to ameliorate any of the problems or add to the fun the game provides. And Bethesda Game Studios just is too cagey for their own good. It's a product of the love their fan base has for their IP, from Fallout to Elder Scrolls to Starfield. There are people who are only fans of Starfield, and if you're only in that camp, you're kind of sitting there going, all right, what's, what's the plan? We know you're supporting the game for a while, but you're giving us a lot of nothing here. Some people are only Fallout fans. What's going on with the franchise? Like You've got to talk to the fans, because then what happens is expectations build, anger builds, and then you get what's happening with Starfield. Speaking of which, sometimes I think in the pre-release of your games, please keep in mind that you can't drop key details of your games in like a GQ interview and then leave out that in like the big Starfield developer direct. I say, for example, how Todd Howard in a GQ interview had mentioned that Starfield explores differently and he's unsure how it's going to be received. Probably something that should have been said on a public level to gauge expectations. I would put money on it that so many of Starfield's problems wouldn't have been discussed if Bethesda was actually open about how exploration was truly going to work or any trepidation that they felt heading into launch on that. But instead, it was, unless you watch the Mr. Matty channel, buried in a GQ article, and that was like a couple of weeks from launch. You know, the decision was made for people by that point. So I just feel like Bethesda needs to communicate these sorts of things better. I said I had a hot take on this list. I have an item on this list here that I don't think anyone's going to want to hear, but I'm going to say it anyway. Keep the creation engine. To me, I think a lot of people use this as an easy argument against Bethesda. Oh my God, it's the creation engine for literally every problem the game has. And I get it because that's all you hear online. And I'm not here saying that the creation engine is literally blameless. But at the same time, I have to look at it honestly. This is the engine that powered some of the greatest games that we have enjoyed, like Skyrim. It has powered games like Fallout 4. When I look at Starfield and I see the critique is, it's the engine, man. The engine is limiting Bethesda. To me, that feels like an ill-conceived argument not targeting the true problem of their game. Starfield to me, and maybe your interpretation is different, its problems boil down to game design. Game design was its biggest issue. And by that, I mean how they handled fast traveling, how they handled exploration. These are creative choices that go along the way where you have this game you dream of making and the game you kind of can make. And there's that kind of in-between area that you're hoping you fall between. And that's the challenge of game development is what are you gonna cut and what choice are you gonna go forward with? And what I see in Starfield are choices that just didn't pan out well. That's not padding over the problems of the game. It's just, I think, honestly tackling what was wrong with the title. I don't think Creation Engine is at the heart of any of Starfield's issues. Some people will say, well, because of Creation Engine, that's why the design was limited. But there, I would respectfully disagree and say that I look at Skyrim and Fallout 4 and don't see limited games there. I see excellent games that had great design decisions made 
that led to feeding the game's strengths. Fallout 4's biggest complaint really was the lack of role playing. That was a creative decision made by Bethesda. It had nothing to do with the engine. Skyrim's biggest problem, I would say, went also to lack of role playing and writing. But when you look at the adventures and the exploration and how many areas you could go into and the amount of DLC, it kind of fades, right? It wasn't an engine problem there either. Again, I get it, creation engine is buggy, but I look at it truly this way. The same people who have called for the engine to be torn down, thrown out, and for Bethesda to take in Unreal Engine or Unity, for example, also are the same people oftentimes saying, oh, you, you, we need the mods. Mods are why I play Bethesda games in the first place. Creation Engine is one of the most customizable engines out there. Not to say that other games don't have fantastic mods. I look at Cyberpunk, there's a wonderful modding community there for the Red Engine. It is possible to mod other engines. I just think with what makes Bethesda Game Studios games popular and what gives them a level of interactivity is through the Creation Engine. Again, I'm not telling you it's perfect. I'm not saying your criticisms of it are wrong. I'm just saying that I think we're sometimes avoiding the real problems, which are more difficult to convey, which is that Starfield's problems, to me, as someone who even loves the game, I put in my top 10 of the year, to me, is about design, not engine limitations. So I think stick with Creation Engine. And naturally, that'll make some people sick to their stomach to hear. But look, it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. They've had so many moments they could have dropped this thing. And with Starfield, they doubled down and did Creation Engine 2, which many people thought was going to be a brand new engine. But it's just like Unreal Engine 4 to Unreal Engine 5, right? Like, you know, it's still going to be Unreal Engine, but there's going to be a lot of new features and additions there. And when you look at what Starfield did on a technical level when it came to polish, I thought, you know what? This feels like a pretty good upgrade. So, so yeah, I know it's a hot take, but I always keep it honest here and I'm more than willing to hear the disagreement down below as I'm sure it will be there, no doubt about it. So the last thing I wanted to touch on for Bethesda was their focus of the future. Speaking of the engine, part of the reason they want to keep that the same is Bethesda's hiring a lot of modders. And when modders are working with your tool set, you kind of want to keep them familiar with that because what happens is it cuts off that immediate process of training the new guy or gal. The pipeline just has to be established, but otherwise they're pretty familiar with what you're going to be using in-house. And that's a great strength to have as a developer who's hiring and growing and is now first party and owned by Microsoft. But Future Focus is in a different way. Todd Howard has guided many of Bethesda Game Studios' greatest games and continues to do so. But like any human here, we all have an expiration date. And I know that's very sad to say. But what I mean by this is that Todd won't be at Bethesda Game Studios forever. And if there's one thing I'm not seeing at the company that I'm a little bit disappointed in, it's that they're not really focusing on nurturing the next generation of talent. That's something I love about Tango Gameworks. You had Shinji Mikami and John Johannes there, and Shinji Mikami was working closely with John Johannes and letting all this newer, younger talent do their own thing, and that led to Hi-Fi Rush. You had Akumi Nakamura there, who was kind of originally supposed to be the protege for Shinji Mikami. That obviously went a completely different direction. She left, she started her own team, announced her own game at the Game Awards of 2023. The point being, that studio was really focused on having a vet leader at the top guiding the new generation and then eventually moving on to do something else. Whereas I feel like with Bethesda Game Studios, it's trying to pull Todd Howard in every single direction. Work on the Indiana Jones game, Todd. Work on Starfield. Work on the Fallout remasters or whatever. Work on Elder Scrolls 6. It's like, this is one human. And when his bandwidth gets spread this far, I can't imagine we're getting the best out of him in his final years of his career. Who knows how long he hangs around. Maybe it's beyond Elder Scrolls 6. Many people are convinced that's his last game. And if it is, I hope they get on top of things quick and they start to nurture who's the next person who's going to get on stage and talk about Bethesda games. Who's going to pioneer the next generation of Bethesda Game Studios games? That's a legacy that can't continue solely through Todd and needs to exist through someone else as well. Pete Hines is left. Jeff Gardner is out. So gradually the old round table of Bethesda Knights is starting to fall off and either start their own adventures or doing something else. And so here we are at the end of it all. What are fans going to get who are in it for the long haul with Bethesda Game Studios? That's what I'm looking for here. So these are a few ways that I think Bethesda could be fixed here from building around their small team size to better communication to keeping the creation engine and building games around it with proper design and a focus on the future. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what you think would quote fix Bethesda in response to my video essay I put out earlier on. 
Looking forward to seeing your thoughts. Take great care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time around. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.